future, it will be scaled later, as one fine day, into the large. Thomas DeMond's miniatures. These are, of course, this big photographed, but we imagine them large. Much as we would, perhaps, this sort of model. Broadacre City, of course, was presented to the world in 1935, ironically, the heart of monopoly capitalism and urban congestion um, in New York. Um, perhaps the, in this, the most, um, perhaps the most important, if you count only in terms of a kind of quantification of, uh, quantification of popularity, um, the artist that is that has sold more paintings than any other artist ever, has sold more pounds of art than any artist ever, whose work is in the homes of 10 million Americans, who, whose company is traded on NASDAQ, and generates $100 million a year, selling 15 million paintings a year. Easily the largest in terms of the acreage of paint, the acreage of painting. Someone who sold $2 million worth of art in one hour on QVC. But who also has work is, of course, Thomas Decay. But interestingly about Thomas Kincaid, at least for us, is that his works are not only art, if you wish to call it that, but they are also pictures of buildings. They are architectural drawings. There's also a Thomas Kincaid community near Vacaville, where the buildings, the, the, the paintings themselves, were divert, were divirtualized into an actual housing community. The new, we also then, or the other thing, we'll sort of wrap this section. The, there is a, a, also, this is of course the New City Project, Peter Frankfurt, Greg, Greg Lennon, and, and uh, Alex McDowell. What we might think of an inverse Bilbao effect, where Bilbao was about the iconic image of architecture circulating around the world and motivating economic realities. The attempt now is to produce those images in advance of the project itself, so as to organize or magnetize, in some way, centrally, capital, interest, and culture around the project itself, so that the image can work to monetize the building, the artifact, into reality. Projective program effect turns into itself. Then, the interfacial image, our third and last mode of the image, where the real and the virtual converge, the real into the virtual, the virtual into the real. A diagram not of something that has or has or will happen, neither imminent nor projective, as much as it is instrumental, though imminent and projective as well. In fact, I want to concentrate on this mode of the image. It says because I think in a way it has the most productive potential for architecture and for architecture's productive demise. In a way, we can think of the instrumental, the, the interfacial image as a kind of diagram but a diagram that has become so intensified with computational capacity that the diagram, in fact, is able to work as an instrument to control that which it diagrams. The chain of signification representation works both ways. It becomes the building element of, 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 of any kind of digital city, techno environment. If we're going, you know, think back to Rainer Bannum's call for the, for the same sort of, same sort of uh, processes um, and environments. But here the work is not between the virtual, I don't mean between that which is software and that which is hardware, um, but rather is a city of interfaces. Interfaces hard and soft, architectural and software. It is a projective image in that it, is a, that, it, that it promises a kind of vicarious causality, not as a picture of form, but as an actual image instrument that you can use. Not an affective sensation of pictorial reference, but one of real sensual experience, directly into and onto the real as a surficial effect, more than a functive directly or a percept functive convergence. The phone. If the program is not on the floor, then where is it? Well, the one place it is is in your hand. There are roughly 6.7 billion people in the world, 3.5 billion of them, um, use a phone. Nokia sells on the order of a million phones per week, which averages to about 16 phones per second. The phone is and will be the first computer for most of the world. Computation will be first experienced by most of the world as an embodied, 
cognitive extension, something that exists as a capacity to control the world directly. Sitting in traffic on a Los Angeles freeway, looking at my edits for this essay, I'm reminded of John Didion's revelation that this is the most authentic Angelino social experience. We are not going any place, all lined up behind our windshields. We are all already there. Today, buffered a bunker, we are also now on our phones and PDAs, taking meetings, texting, emailing, Googling, checking on this and that, editing essays on our iPhones. This is the home and office. We don't need to arrive because we're already there. If this was your home, you would live here by now. This is a grid that segments and enables an inertial sort of mobility. Ensconced in our furtive provisional networks, the car isn't the primary technology of mobility anymore, however, even in LA. It's gone the way of the building. By the time Ryder Bannon had arrived, the car had eaten LA. Now the phone has eaten the car. How can we properly then theorize this digital at the scale of the city? First, it's not really about newness. Foundational, even primal conditions are now reanimated. Layering effects, invisible information made visible, physical computation, collapse distances, remote control, etc., that can't be reduced to a new digital machine in an old analog world. I think of Sanford Quinter's allegory of digital plasticine. Humans as a species have evolved little in the last 100,000 years, and hardly at all since the appearance of writing. Our senses, our inherent built in media, are the same as those that allow us to survive the predatory rhythms of the primordial savanna. And in the city's very real landscape of information production and reception, those same rhythms persist in communication with our new media and augmented cognition. Architecture is at least partially tuned to these. Reiner Bannum's call for a more intense technologization of the disciplinary doxa, blending urban and cybernetic programs, is a now permanent feature of the discourse. And any such programming of this perceptual space casts the digital city as a shared nervous system. And today, the rupture of digital information networks through the membrane of the city into the open view of the people and their mobile screens relies on the body's capacity to proprioceptively map its own displacement in real and imagined geographies. If the first function of the city is proximity to people, markets, goods, transit, information, the smart digital handset condenses the city itself into an extensible software plus hardware platform. Globally, more people own mobile phones than regularly access the web through other means. And for the most and foremost of the world, as said, their first computer will be a handheld one. Computation will not arrive to them as a desk-bound or even lap-bound experience, but as an active network linking speech to data for ambulant gesturing bodies moving through active worlds. Phone plus city is a composite rewrite medium, allowing for real-time communication through multiple modes, now and in situ, and represents, in combination, an important infrastructure of any emergent global democratic society. It can do, it can do this not only because it enables physical and communicative and thereby social mobility, but because it dramatically reinserts specific location into digital space and does so by making location gestural embodied. It introduces then a new genre of computing, interaction in the wild. The city, as seen through the medium of that face, oozes with living data to be touched and rewritten all over again. Interaction with this information is recursive. Action taken with it on a micro level is itself new information, with which in turn informs everyone else that what everyone else sees at a macro level. And in this recursion, the presence of the information, good or bad information, can be directly disruptive of social behavior as people change their paths and decisions in the image of the actions and swerves of others that they see indexed in at-hand interfaces. The graphical appearance of that interface then is less a figural representation than a direct urban event, part of a bigger circuit, part of bigger circuits of concrete movement. For the architect then, the digital city becomes a habitat. It becomes the foundational layer of the designable software stack. As the work of that material is more available to the calculations of software, the program itself becomes as portable as the handset for which one or many users, projects, transpose programming into a given locale 
at a given time. Much as, just as we as society